I am your moderator for today's session. The structure of the session is that we're going to listen to two presentations and then do questions at the end. So if you have any questions uh, and they come up, feel free to drop them in the chat throughout. They will be answered at the end of uh, the two presentations. So the first presentation uh, is on geospatial discovery for Canadian research data. And our speakers are Mark Goodwin, Paul Dante, and Eugene Barsky. I have brief bios that I'm just going to quickly read out and then hand over to Mark. Mark Goodwin is the metadata coordinator for the Geodesy project and works alongside Portage's Federated Research Data Repository, FERDER, team to provide expertise for creation management and presentation of metadata for geospatial discovery. Paul Dante is a software engineer on the Geodesy project and works to create an open source data pipeline to help researchers find and access geospatial and quasi-geospatial data. And Eugene Barsky is the head of research, the Research Commons at UBC and is the lead principal investigator for the National Geodesy Project. Thank you, Eka. I'll just take a moment to share my screen. Start by saying thank you to everyone for uh, being here for our presentation. Happy to be here. Uh, and thanks for the introduction, Eka. So Paul and uh, myself are going to be handling uh, most of the presentation duties. Uh, Eugene has, kind of, we've kind of adapted to the new uh, virtual conference world and Eugene's kind of become our like chat guy. So he can answer questions uh, real time in the chat if you have any. And uh, he'll be around for, for the discussion at the end too. Just before getting started, uh, I do want to acknowledge our appreciation and privilege in working at UBC, which is located on the uh, traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. So in this presentation, um, we're going to talk a bit about uh, what geodesy is and why we made it. Also, uh, a little bit about the technology behind it. And finally, we will do a live demonstration. So uh, the first thing I'll note is that Geodesy uh, is live at geo.ferder.ca. So you're welcome to uh, head on over to the website to check it out and play around with it yourself. Uh, starting with an overview, it's an open source discovery tool that allows users to find open data from Canadian researchers visually, spatially, and quickly. Uh, a few key points, search results are driven by an interactive map. So that's kind of the main feature of Geodesy. Users come to the portal and uh, search for data based on its location on a map. It contains data that is uh, both geospatial in nature uh, and also any data that is simply associated with the location. So this is, this is something that we see as setting Geodesy apart from more traditional geospatial discovery tools. Uh, in that we're, we're including, uh, you know, anything, any data that just has a place name uh, associated with it. So it could be a survey of residents of uh, Prince George, and that would be mapped uh, on the location of Prince George on the map and available for discovery. It provides a map-based search for Canada's Federated Research Data Repository, also known as FERDER for short. So FERDER is an existing uh, data discovery portal uh, that kind of acts as a one-stop shop for searching for Canadian research data. It pulls from a uh, wide variety of source, uh, repository sources, uh, different Canadian institutions. And the idea is that Geodesy acts as an al a map-based alternative to the existing text-based search for further. Scholars Portal Dataverse uh, is currently the only uh, source for data content in Geodesy. Uh, when we started uh, building the, the, uh, the tool uh, in a portion of our funding we're kind of calling phase one now, uh, we started with Scholars Portal Dataverse uh, just because it already does contain uh, a, a lot of data from different Canadian institutions. The long-term plan for Geodesy is for it to be uh, similar to what FERDER is now, uh, kind of an aggregate search 
uh, portal for data from across Canadian research institutions. And the last thing I'll mention on this slide is that everything about it is open source and the code's freely available for others to adapt. Uh, it's available on our GitHub page, which uh, we will link to at the end of this presentation. So why is it useful? Why use it? Because data can be hard to find, especially if location is a significant aspect of what you're looking for. And an example I use in this situation is a friend of mine who is researching climate change impact on tree lines in uh, an, uh, a location that's not really defined by official boundaries or regions. It's an area in that touches on northern BC, Alaska, and the Yukon. So if she wanted to build a text-based search in a database to capture this location, uh, it might look something like this. You'd start out with uh, BC and all the different terms you could think of for BC, but then you don't really want to get the lower mainland of BC in there. You don't want Vancouver. You really only want northern BC. So maybe building in some sort of proximity search with north there. Um, I also mentioned it, it touches on Alaska and the Yukon, so you need to capture that as well. Now data might be associated with just a park name, so you'd have to think about that too. Uh, parks can be um, called preserves or reserves or recreation areas, and you can see it gets pretty complicated pretty quickly. So the idea with a tool like Geodesy, you just zoom into the area you're interested in on the map, hit search, and there you go. Much nicer, much easier, much cleaner. Uh, so this is a look at Geodesy's interface, uh, a bit of a sneak preview for later in the presentation uh, when we will do a live demonstration. So uh, for now, I'm going to hand it off to Paul, who is first going to talk a little bit about the technology behind Geodesy. Thank you, Mark. Um, so as Mark said, uh, uh, as you can see here, I'm going to go a little bit to the architecture. Uh, as Mark said, initially we are just pulling information from Scholar's portal Dataverse. Uh, so we are taking metadata and geospatial files out of Scholar's portal and bringing them into our uh, middleware uh, VM. Um, the geospatial files are being put into GeoServer, which is used for geospatial file previews. Uh, the metadata is processed. We add some extra components to it um, which is sort of dates when it's collected and things of that nature. Then that is sent to our front end, uh, which is GeoBlacklight, which is a map-based uh, open source component. It's that GeoBlacklight that most people will interact with. Uh, so research researchers will go to our website and that website is an instance of GeoBlacklight. So that's phase one. Um, phase two, which we are working on at the moment, uh, changes it. So we are no longer just doing Scholar's Portal. We are going to include a whole bunch of other institutions. Um, originally, we had a, a different plan, but we are now going to actually uh, harvest direct or get that information directly from the further harvester. Um, so they're already harvesting from a bunch of different repositories. And then we can just connect to them, pull the metadata and geospatial information into uh, our middleware. From there, it's the same as the first part. Um, so, bounding boxes are sort of a key component to any data set that is going to be displayed on Geodesy. Geodesy cannot function with a data set that we can't either find or create a bounding box for. The reason for this is that Geo Blacklight uses bounding boxes for discovery. So, um, those bounding boxes can come in the form of a researcher entering a bounding box into the metadata, uh, or they can come from there either being geospatial files or place name metadata, um, both of which we can generate bounding boxes from. It is good, important to note that in our uh, GeoBlacklight instance, every bounding box associated with a record uh, or with a data set is its own record on GeoBlacklight. 
So what you'll be looking at on GeoBlock Lite is the sort of the most precise um, search for that data set. So if that data set has like three different geospatial files, each one would be their own record. So you are looking at exactly what that file is dealing with. Any data set that doesn't include any coordinates, geospatial file types, or geographic coverage metadata is not eligible to be put into to GeoBlacklight because of GeoBlacklight's functionality. So we had to set a sort of priority for figuring out um, bounding boxes for Geodesy. Uh, we decided the most important ones are if we can get a bounding box from a geospatial file, because that would be the most sort of precise representation of what is being covered. We use GDAL to generate those coordinates from a geospatial file. GDAL is an open source tool that allows you to process geospatial files. If, you, if there are not geospatial files for us to process, um, our next option uh, is, here's a, an example of metadata from Dataverse. So down at the bottom, you can see there's a geographic bounding box with um, different coordinates that you can add, put in there. Uh, you can actually put in multiple bounding boxes into the metadata. Each bounding box you enter would again be a separate record on GeoBlacklight. If nothing has been put into that geographic bounding box metadata, our next option is the geographic coverage you can see up above. Um, but we did realize that just using the geographic coverage and sort of dealing with whatever people put in there could be problematic due to issues such as if someone just put Vancouver into the city and that's all they put. We could guess that they're talking about Vancouver, BC, but they could be talking about Vancouver, Washington. Um, and so that because of the ambiguity, we set up a hierarchy of what they need to put in. Do they put in a country? That's great. We can deal with the country. There aren't any country names that are, are reproduced or doubled up to the best of our knowledge. If they put in a state or province, they also have to have a country to differentiate. And then if there's a city, you actually have to have additionally a state slash province and a country associated with it. Um, all of those we then put into GeoNames, which is another open source component that can provide us with a bounding box based on those names. So regardless of the geographic coverage metadata, so they put stuff into the geographic coverage, even if what they put in is valid, we would still flag it for manual review if they added information to the other category, the sort of the fourth box. The reason for that is that it, there could be something in there that modifies everything else. So we just want to make sure that there is some manual review of that. Uh, additionally, if there are any sort of issues with the coverage, be it there's not enough information or due names, can't figure out a bounding box from it, or it bounds, finds a, uh, a record, but again, no bounding box, then we do manual review of it. So we've only dealt with Dataverse and GeoServer, or sorry, not GeoServer, and uh, Scholars Portal for um, our uh, data sets at the moment. The unfortunate reality is that each different repository type has a slightly different structure or significantly different structure to how they uh, present their data, what data is actually collected. And there's different levels of curation from different repositories. Uh, as of such, we are expecting to, there to be a fair number of unique issues with each type of repository, and we'll be dealing with those individually as they come up. Uh, now I'm going to give it back to Mark to talk a little bit more about metadata. Thank you, Paul. So um, the next few slides are taking a look at our metadata process. The metadata really enables the discovery to happen. It's the information that that the software uses to for for searching and that kind of thing. So for phase one of the project, as uh, Paul highlighted. We started out with just Dataverse, this pipeline to Dataverse. So from Dataverse's uh, metadata schema, which is basically the um, list of, of metadata fields that Dataverse uses, we crosswalked, we transferred that metadata over to our own Geodesy schema, uh, which really we just based on Dataverse's, which in turn Dataverse's is based on DDI, which is a, uh, a common metadata standard for the social sciences. Uh, so we, we transferred that over to our, our own schema and then we also generated and enhanced some of that meta metadata kind of in-house with our project. Uh, we added in information including 
some of the extra information we got from GDAL, if we analyzed the geospatial files, if there was projection information, that kind of thing, stuff that Dataverse wasn't capturing, if we were, if we were accessing that, we we're adding it to the metadata to increase the description of the resources. Uh, we were also adding in information about, you know, how we generated bounding boxes, for example, kind of how we treated the data as it went through Geodesy. So from there, we crosswalked it out to ISO 19139, which is an XML structure for the ISO 19115 standard, which is a commonly used standard for geospatial resources. It provides a uh, full and uh, quite a comprehensive description for, for geospatial re, uh, uh, information resources. Uh, and that's available with all the records in Geodesy for, for each data record. We also uh, crosswalked it to the GeoBlacklight schema. So Paul mentioned GeoBlacklight, that's the, um, the user interface that the user sees when uh, they come to Geodesy. Uh, the GeoBlacklight schema is the information that it uses to uh, just function properly, run searches, you know, map the bounding boxes, that kind of thing. So looking at phase two, our original plan was to uh, kind of keep going the way we were, uh, individually crosswalking metadata from each new repository we were going to add as we uh, expanded our source content. Uh, you know, CCAN, for example, is the next repository we're looking at uh, adding. Uh, Socrata would be another one. Each of these would require its own crosswalk. And the issue with that is it's a lot of crosswalks. It's a lot of work. There's a lot of repositories out there. Uh, so our new plan, uh, thanks to our friends at uh, Portage and Furder specifically, uh, is to take advantage of the further harvester, which is going to make it a lot easier. Uh, so uh, as we mentioned before, further is an existing tool. They already have all those crosswalks in place going to their harvester from these repositories. So all it requires on our part is to build a crosswalk from the further harvester to our own geodesy schema. Uh, and then we can take advantage of all the, uh, the, the metadata crosswalking transfers that are already uh, in existence. The only thing we needed to do was add some uh, additional capacity in the further harvester for collecting some of the geospatial information that Geodesy needs, which wasn't really that hard to do. At this point, I'm going to switch to a uh, live demonstration. We can do a walkthrough of, uh, of the site and how to use it. So if you navigate to uh, further, you're going to see uh, this home page here. Uh, the main text search is kind of in the middle here. And then if you look to the right, there's this link to the map search. That's going to take you to Geodesy's homepage. And this is what you're going to see uh, when, you, uh, when you go through. Hopefully the first thing users notice when they come to this page is this banner we put at the top. And what it says is it just makes clear that the content uh, that the user searching in Geodesy is different than Furder's main search. So we really want to reduce confusion there. Um, so we just make it clear that Scholars Portal Dataverse is, makes up all the content for Geodesy right now. Um, and that's also why, why we're calling it uh, a beta map search too, um, because uh, as compared to Furder, which is kind of a fully established discovery platform with uh, a, a large aggregate of, uh, of search content, uh, we're still, we've still just got the one source. Beyond that, uh, hopefully your eye is drawn to the main map portal right in the middle. So this is a, uh, it's an interactive map that the user can uh, move around, zoom in. Uh, if you shift click and you can draw a box for the map to zoom in towards. Once you've settled on an area that's of interest to you, you can click search to uh, go through to the results page and you'll see something like this. Uh, so what this means, what you're seeing here, there are 894 data 
records that are located in this area of the map. As you hover over the uh, different results, you can see the uh, blue bounding box pop up. So that's uh, the location of the data. So Paul talked about the bounding boxes. So that's what you're seeing um, on, the, uh, on the map there as you hover over each one of these results. There are some, uh, some options for uh, limiting and refining the, the results on the left-hand side here. I'll just point out a few um, relevant to uh, this conference. Uh, Arts and Humanities does, does make up a large chunk of the data that's available in Geodesy. Um, data type is, is a useful one because uh, we've it illustrates where we've kind of separated the traditional geospatial data like polygons and raster and that kind of thing from the kind of quasi geospatial data that we've pulled in which is just everything uh that ha just just has a place name associated with it it's not actually geospatial data um, but it has a place name and we've mapped it so we've put that in this undetermined catchment um which is the best label we could come up with uh, after much arguing and debating. Um, if anyone has any ideas for something better we could call it, we're uh, welcome to suggestions, but that's what it is right now. Uh, so that is one way to kind of separate those two types of data in here. Now, if you move the map around, uh, it's going to, um, it's going to change the results. Uh, so it's it's interactive within this uh, results page here. Uh, you can still play around with the map. Um, and a note about the the sort options. There's a few different sort options, and the relevance sort is the default uh, sort view. What that does is it prioritizes bounding boxes that are best uh, fitted to the map window that you're searching. So you can see most of these uh, bounding boxes are, are prominent on this, this window here, even though within this uh, set of 799 results, there's uh, going to be data sets that are, that are the size of North America that are much larger, or perhaps there's some that are very small, just like a small island on this map or something. Those are gonna be suppressed down the list. And uh, as you move it around, it, it prioritizes uh, data that is prominent on the map that you're looking at. Now, if we click through to a record, you'll see something like this. So you get a, uh, some basic descriptive metadata here, tells you about what the data is. This link uh, takes you back to the source of the data, so Scholars Portal in this case. Uh, I selected a geospatial um, example on purpose. So if it's if it's geospatial data, you'll get a, uh, a preview of the data on a, on a map here, which is also interactive. Uh, you can play around with this a little bit. You'll also get a uh, link uh, to a direct download of the geospatial data. Uh, I mentioned the ISO 19139 metadata that's avail available for download here on, on each record. And this, uh, this example also highlights uh, something that Paul mentioned before, in that if there are multiple, uh, multiple bounding boxes, like multi this one, in this case, there are multiple geospatial files as part of this data set. So we've created a record in Geodesy for each of those files. Uh, so that gets noted in the title here. This is record nine of 56 for the same data set. Uh, and then it also uh, is the different um, data files get linked in this data relations section. And if we go to this browse all records, then it lists them out nicely here. So you can see some of them um, have slightly different uh, locations. And that is uh, basically the gist of it. Uh, there's not a whole lot to it. Um, that's kind of by design. Uh, we, our intention was really to uh, make something that uh, is easy to use for 
uh, folks in different subject areas with different experience levels. We wanted it to be, uh, you know, not a really complicated, uh, just a, a very accessible and clean discovery experience. So I'll bring it back to the slides for the last few here. Quick uh, note on our planned next steps. We are continuing the work to integrate Geodesy with Furter's Metadata Harvester. We also have a French translation plan for the user interface. Uh, and also for the user interface, we're planning a um, uh, kind of large overhaul to further integrate uh, Geodesy with Furter's website to make it more of a, a seamless search experience for users. And of course, we'll be adding more uh, source repositories as we move along here. So we're going to expand the content for Geodesy. Uh, at this point, I'd just like to acknowledge the generous funding that uh, uh, we received through the Portage Network from Canada's new Digital Research Infrastructure Organization and uh, also our original funders, Canary. And many thanks to all of our uh, fantastic partners. It's definitely been a collaborative effort and we are hugely grateful for all the support we've received. We have our contact information here. If you'd like to reach out, feel, please feel free. Also, our GitHub uh, page is linked here if you want to uh, check that out too. Uh, that this point, I'll just say thank you. Uh, this is a This slide is labeled questions, but I think those are coming after the next uh, presentation. So, I'll turn it back over to Eka. Thank you, Mark. Uh, our next presentation is on uh, geospatial data from the Map Cabinet: Digitizing British Columbia's Mid-Century Forest Cover. Uh, the speakers are Claire Williams and Evan Thornberry. And again, I have a couple of um, brief bios to read out for each of them. Claire Williams works as a forestry archivist at the University of British Columbia's Rare Books and Special Collections RBSC Library on the Vancouver campus. And uh, Evan Thornberry is the Geographic Information Systems GIS librarian at the University of British Columbia, where he supports teaching, learning, and research with geospatial information and technology. Just a quick reminder that if you have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat throughout and we will be going through them at the end of the session. Over to you, Claire. Thank you, Eka. So I'm just going to share my screen here and then ask, um, well, actually, Evan, you've been introduced. So I'll just go ahead and start. So I'm, uh, as Eka said, I'm Claire Williams. I work as a forestry archivist at Rare Books and Special Collections. And we're at the UBC Vancouver campus located on the unceded ancestral and traditional territories of the Musqueam people. We're going to share today about a project that Evan and I collaborated on digitizing British Columbia's historic forest cover. In the span of seven months, we together with a larger team came up with a project plan, secured funding, and scanned and geo-referenced 149 maps showing the forest cover of the entire province of British Columbia. We hope that you come away from this presentation knowing that with the right amount of flexibility, minimal resources, and creative thinking, collaborative projects across disciplines and faculties are not only possible, but also desirable. So we've organized the presentation chronologically and we'll be taking you through the various steps of the project in the order they occurred. I'm going to walk you through the steps I was primarily involved with and Evan will wrap up the presentation with the project portion he oversaw. We're looking forward to any questions you might have at the end of the presentation. And I also want to mention that this project wouldn't have occurred if it weren't for the doctoral research of PhD candidate Ira Sutherland, who is here in the audience and available to answer any questions folks might have for him at the end of the presentation as well. So without further ado, I'll get started. So first, what were these maps? What makes them so special? Well, a few things. First of all, they were the first ever systematic inventory of British Columbia's forest cover. Previous inventories had been attempted, one in 1918 and one in 1937, but these weren't at all systematic. They compiled existing data and in some cases relied on guesswork. The 1958 maps were created by the British Columbia Forest Service Inventory Division and were based on information collected through land surveys, forest inventories, and aerial photographs. 
The standard format and style of these maps made them very easy to read and compare differences between them. The maps were special to me from an archival point of view because they made up a significant portion of the cartographic materials within the Macmillan Liddell limited font. Font is an archival term, meaning the whole of the records created and or received by a business or individual in the course of their normal activities. In this case, the records of historic forestry giant, Macmillan Bledel Limited. One of my major responsibilities as a forestry archivist was to make this fawn more accessible to researchers. The Macmillan Bledel Limited fawn contains about 500 boxes of textual records, over 20,000 photographs, and about 500 maps documenting the company's 90-year history of forestry operations in the province. Before I began working on the materials, these items were only accessible through a paper or PDF finding aid, which was over 600 pages long and very difficult to navigate. One of the first things I did was transfer this PDF finding aid to our archival database so that all of these items were now described electronically and could be easily navigated and searched. Due to this work, I was well aware of the interim forest cover series, the 149 maps of the province's forests hiding within the fall and shown here the envelopes that they were originally stored in. Apparently, these maps were kept in the reference library of Macmillan Liddell and had been transferred to us along with the rest of the company's materials in the late 1980s. My goal, to get the materials out of our vault and into the hands of students and researchers who could put these records to uses I could only imagine. So lucky for me, this project provided the perfect opportunity to do just that. In May of 2019, I received a phone call from UBC forestry librarian Sally Taylor in regards to a student she'd been in contact with who was searching for historic inventories of BC forests. These kinds of phone calls absolutely make my day and I asked Sally to bring him into the archives so I could start out and cart out a number of different records he might be interested in. The next week, Sally, along with PhD candidate Ira Sutherland, his supervisor, Dr. Janine Ramtula, and UBC GIS librarian, Evan Thornberry, who had also been helping Ira on his hunt for materials, came down to rare books and special collections. Together, we looked at several items I thought might be of interest, and the gold ticket item ended up being the 149 maps from the interim forest cover series. Incidentally, Evan had also brought one of these maps to show Ira as the Kerner Library map collection also holds a complete set. Great minds think alike. During that meeting, the five of us hatched an idea to scan the maps so that Ira would be able to use the historic geographic data for his research. It was May and he was hoping to have the map scanned and georeferenced by December. I had never seen a digitization project get off the ground and completed in such a short timeline and had my doubts but my colleagues thought it just might be possible and Ira and Janine were on board to do whatever they could to make it happen. Following a meeting with the Digitization Center's Larissa Ringham, Associate Head of Digital Programs and Services, and Rob Stabravi, Digital Projects Librarian, to make sure they were on board with undertaking the project, we began in earnest trying to figure out how we could make the project work within our parameters. In order to complete the project by the deadline, we did have to come up with some creative solutions and yes, collaboration and cooperation were crucial here. Janine and Ira volunteered to apply for funding for a work learn student and a subsidized, position, a subsidized position through UBC, in addition to providing some funds from their research department. The work learn position would allow one student to work on scanning the maps and then continue to work with Ira on his research. The next step in the project would involve creating metadata for the scan maps. This job would need to be completed by someone with library archives experience, and Evan and I collaborated on creating a position to fulfill a professional experience project through the UBC School of Information. These projects allow students at the school to do 120 hours of work in exchange for course credit, and we deemed that would be more than enough time to create metadata for the map collection and each map individually. The last part of the project involved georeferencing the scan maps so that the image files matched up with the geographic data. For this work, Evan and Ira planned on crowdsourcing individual folks interested in georeferencing, and Evan will talk more about that later. There were a lot of moving parts, which we didn't have full control over, and at first we weren't sure if the whole thing would work. We weren't sure if the work learn student position would be funded by the university, and we weren't sure that we could find appropriate people to fill both student positions. Fortunately, we were granted the funding and found two students who were perfect fits for the project. 
One of them, Kevin Hugh, had worked with Ira before and was more than willing to scan the maps as well as to keep working with Ira when the scanning was done. The other, Francis Chen, was a student at the School of Information and was excited to work on metadata and with geographic information systems. By August of 2019, we created a project plan, hired the students, received the necessary funding, and could be begin working on the project itself. Now that the real work had begun, there were new challenges to overcome. Working together with digital projects librarian, Arian Vining, we began tackling these one by one. The first of these involved creating identifiers for the maps. Prior to my work on the fall in 2019, the maps had only been described as a group of 149 maps, which really doesn't do for eventually linking the archival descriptions to the scanned maps themselves. Francis Chen, our professional experience student from the library school, helped us solve this problem by individually labeling each of the maps with the new archival identifier, which would assist with item level control of the maps during the scanning, while she also measured each map and captured key information such as official title and date for the maps. Another challenge came from the fact that we had two versions of the same map collection in deciding how to use which collection for what. Because the maps at RBSC were stored in oversized flat storage versus folded in the envelopes that you saw earlier as they were at Kerner, we decided to use these for the physical scanning. We could then refer to the maps in Kerner for the metadata of the collection as a whole, as it was much more accurate and accessible than the description in the PDF finding aid I mentioned earlier. Arian and I supervised Francis's creation of item level metadata for the map collection. We had to finish the metadata in order for the maps to be scanned, and thanks to Francis's hard work, this was done in just about a month, allowing the project to move forward on schedule. Kevin Hugh was trained at the Digitization Center by Laura Ferris and Rob Stabravi and began scanning the maps. And here I'll turn it over to Evan. Okay, yeah, so um, scanning, the scanning activities started on the 149 maps and their informational envelopes during the fall term of 2019. Kevin Hu, the graduate student from the Faculty of Forestry who was recommended for the project by Ira was hired as the work-learn student to begin the scanning work under the management of Rob Ravy of UBC Libraries Digital Lab. Uh, once the maps and envelopes were scanned, they were processed and prepared to be made available online. And now you can find them at their digital, uh, at their collection level landing page at the web address below. And I'm just going to go ahead and, and paste that into the chat. So if anybody wants to take a look, they're more than welcome to. So that's a uh, behind the scenes photograph of Kevin, um, the, um, the scanning uh, work learn student um, carefully you know, feeding a one of the map sheets into a feed scanner. You can also see the maps behind them uh, and kind of get a sense of their physicality, size, and, and color. It's kind of a cool, he looks very happy, so we were, we were very pleased. Uh, metadata, so the metadata is created at, at when library scans all digital objects going into our digital collections. So this also needed to take place for the forest inventory map set. As Claire mentioned, we hired a UBC iSchool grad student through the iSchool's professional experience program to work on this portion of the project. Uh, the grad student would uh, take on the job of creating metadata for each map using existing catalog records and other information derived from the individual sheets. To do this, they would follow directions from UBC Library's metadata manual to generate custom Dublin Core metadata records which would eventually be loaded into our digital collections repository with the scanned maps. Since the metadata work was not going to take, um, it wasn't going to last the entire length of the 120 hour professional experience position, we added a few GIS elements to the position that would extend the findability of maps. In doing this, we realized we need to find the right candidate, somebody that either had some experience in both metadata and GIS or one willing to learn quickly on the job. And fortunately, we found an excellent candidate in Francis Chen, who had a great combination of skills and experience and was really interested in learning some GIS on the job. So in Francis, uh, Francis's original project plan, metadata work would happen between September 6th, I think was the start date, and October 25th. But that was finished quite early. So um, she moved her workspace from IKB and the digital lab over to Kerner Library in early October. And then we started to work on uh, spatial discovery of the maps themselves, of the digital uh, images of the maps. 
So this series of maps that we're working with was published on a grid. Um, the grid spans across BC and each section of the grid represents an individual map from the set. So this is a really common thing for printed map sets that covered a large geographic expanse, uh, but dis it displayed fine details and was ultimately going to be printed on standard paper sizes. Um, so in map libraries where you find stacks of printed maps, these grids always accompany a map set. So anyone that's wanting to find a sheet within the set can quickly look for the grid section, which is usually referenced by an alphanumeric number um, or identifier, and then go to the drawer and find it. So I often call them like a table of contents for maps uh, in a set. And you can see, um, move that off, but you can see this is, the, this is the index for the forest inventory set that we've been talking about. And this would be something that you would find with the physical maps. In the digital world, when these sheets are scanned, um, they aren't physically next to one another as, um, as you would find you know, in the map collection. So they become a bit more disconnected than when they were in the map drawer where everything is right in front of you. Online, the accessibility of the map collection really increases, but not necessarily the findability, especially when you have titles of things that are called like you know, 92N32. Um, it's kind of hard to search for that in a title list or um, browse it in a in a, um, a results list showing titles or or uh, thumbnails. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to take a stab at solving this issue by creating a digital map index for this map set. And to do this, we aligned our work with the Open Index Map Content Format Standard, which is a content format standard being developed by a group of librarians for uh, describing and displaying map indexes in GeoJSON format, which is a text-based geospatial file format that's used in web mapping quite a bit. Um, this, uh, just because we're following Geodesy, the open index map content format standard does also work with GeoBlacklight and ultimately something like this could be put into a discovery inter interface uh, of that nature. So for Francis's second portion of her position, she worked to map the fields from Dublin Core metadata that she created in um, her, the first portion of her position to open index map content format standard fields um, used for digitally recreating indexes. So to complete this part, Francis documented her processes for the metadata, ma uh, metadata field mapping and also created a fishnet grid using uh, GIS. So fishnetting is just a, a GIS term that's um, used for automatically creating the spatial file that represents that grid. Um, and in this case, the, the grid it was really easy to make because it falls on a one degree by one degree grid. Um, so to complete this part, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, finally, this, this was completed when this was completed, we joined the open index map metadata in table format with the spatial file using each map's unique identifier so that each geographic section contained all the metadata needed for that particular location. Uh, let me refresh this really quick, but here's a, this is a, a working example of the final um, index map that, that Francis created. It basically provides the, the digital functionality that a paper map uh, a paper map would do if it were, you know, or a paper map index would do if it was sitting in the drawer. So with this, you can, you know, click on any individual section and get a little bit of information about it, but you could also link directly to uh, one of the images themselves. Um, so for, you know, it takes you to that particular location. Um, you can also see that there's a couple of strange, you know, little I'm just going to zoom in a little bit, but there's some parts of the of some of these index. Uh, I'm sorry, some of the uh, grid sections that have kind of a little extra piece there. That was just kind of an inset map that was indicated on each sheet. So what Francis did was she uh, made note of any map that had an inset map of a of another location and included that in um, the actual GIS grid section so that you get a so none of these pieces of, of Canada or of British Columbia were left out on the index. So then came the georeferencing part. And again, this is, this is largely a, um, uh, a collaborative project with IRA. Um, and there was really some great, great work um, that was done with IRA and a lot of his colleagues in forestry. Um, but the georeferencing part was something that, um, that we really, that IRA really envisioned from the start because ultimately, 
his research was going to depend on this, these, um, the, the georeferencing work. Georeferencing is the process in which scanned images of maps are transformed into a geographically placed image. It's typically the first step in moving a picture of a map towards geographic data. Um, it's also often a manual process where users will identify locations on a scanned image of a map and the equivalent locations in a spatially referenced data set. Uh, because there were several maps in the series, series 149, um, the, and the sheets, um, they indicated grad, graticules of latitude and longitude coordinates. There was some initial consideration for using an automated method to do this, um, such as Quad G, which is which is a which is a um, I guess a, a system meant for identifying text on a map at specific um, latitude and longitude increments, and um, providing automatically providing those reference points between the paper map and a digital um, or geographically referenced data set. Uh, but just because, you know, there were, there were 149 of them, um, we decided that we could probably get away with inviting a crowd or um, a group of volunteers to help us with this, and we could probably do it with enough interested people before the deadline. Um, so what we decided to do was to uh, use the library's computer lab resources and bring in some interested folks together to have a georeferencing party. And the goal was to get um, uh, just a bunch of interested people to contribute to the cause. So the we held a georeferencing party. Uh, we held our at least our first georeferencing party in early December of last year. Um, the workflow for this was Ira would give some background um, and some direction before the session and, and answer some questions from folks about the process. Then volunteers would claim a map from a shared list using a Google Drive uh, to get. To, to get to work on a particular sheet. Uh, when finished with a map, when finished adding these con ground control points, these, these reference points to each sheet, um, they would be transformed using a GIS and then uploaded to cloud storage. And all the information that was needed about each individual sheet was recorded um, on a shared doc, such as um, you know, how many ground control points were used, what the root mean square error was for the transformation, whether or not there was an index on this map and, and other things. Um, and that work continued through December and January to georeference all 149 map images with the help of about 15 volunteers. Um, you can see here the tweet, uh, you can kind of make out the tweet here, but um, this was, uh, this kind of shows the mosaic, the grid, and the mosaic of map sheets kind of coming together to build like a provincial wide geo-referenced um, data set of all of the images kind of um, merged together. So I'm gonna hand it back to Claire to talk a little bit about bringing the maps into the classroom. Thanks, Evan. So in completing the project, I've really enjoyed being able to show other students the digitized maps available for everyone through the UBC Open Collections website. I taught some class sessions to students on how to search for items related to land use history, and the maps provide such a fascinating and comprehensive example of the kind of data set that can be really useful for research projects. I also love talking about these maps because they're a wonderful example of what can be done by librarians and archivists to help students get the resources they need to support their research. I believe that there is immense potential to use materials like these maps to better understand historic trends and apply that understanding to our current context and the issues we face today, such as the climate crisis. Ira's research really showcases this, and it's been a delight to assist it through this project. And with that, we will wrap up with thank you, and I think open the floor to questions. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, just a reminder to everyone that you should feel free to drop questions in the chat. And I believe that we, we can also have you unmute yourselves if you want to, I think you, you're able to unmute yourselves if you'd like to verbally ask instead. 
Um, I don't think that there's anything that hasn't been answered for the geodesy team. Uh, team. We do have, we did have a question about uh, whether or not geodesy had significant historical data for Quebec or Montreal. Eugene, do you want to speak to that? Uh, or does someone else from the geodesy team want to jump in on that as well? There's an answer in the chat. Yeah, I can uh, jump in on that one. Um, yeah, I think Eugene kind of mentioned it in the chat. Our project is really uh, only concerned with providing a discovery service um, and not concerned with um, curating data or, you know, promoting the inclusion of data. We're just kind of uh, providing, providing discovery for what's uh, already available in Scholars Portal Dataverse at this point. So um, it's a good question and we do get a, a lot of questions like that uh, as we expand uh, our uh, source content further. Uh, there will be, you know, a lot more a variety of data in there, um, you know, which is why we're still kind of calling it a, a beta version. Um, so because it is still in kind of like in our minds still uh, in a very kind of early phase here. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we don't really have much of a role to play at this point anyway in the uh, curation and, and uh, the, the variety of, of data that actually shows up in there. Um, on that note, one thing uh, also important is that Geodesy updates every evening. So if something is put in new to Scholars Portal uh, today, it will show up on our site tomorrow. Since I'm not seeing a lot of questions come in, I'm going to jump between the two uh, presentations, if that's okay with everyone. Uh, we have a question. Uh, at, directed at Evan, how would each of these maps uh, be displayed in Geo Blacklight and where would that landing page point to? So, um, you know, it could, it, could, it could happen a number of ways. Uh, the way I have always envisioned it, if it were to be used at UBC Library, um, is that we would use the, the series level index um, to display, you know, the, the index and each individual section on that would link to the digital image of the, uh, of the map that, that are in um, open collections. Um, alternatively, you could be presented an option to, you know, say we had the georeferenced um, data sets or the, the georeferenced sheets. Um, we could provide a, an endpoint to download each individual sheet from that index grid. Um, I, I have a link, you know, I have a link I'm just going to post here just to get an idea of how this is the um, Cornell has, this is their geo portal and they use indexes quite a bit for some of their data sets. And this is just an example of how it would kind of look and feel. Um, this is data, so it's going to provide you a direct link to the image. So yeah, that's that's kind of how I envision it. And there could be all kinds of other things too. You know, I mean, like um, with with GeoServer, you can publish the static or not the static, the georeferenced images um, as rasters. And if you wanted to provide a you know a preview of the entire mosaic, if that was um, ever a possibility. But um, yeah, I guess I. It could it could happen a number of ways. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, we have a question for I think the geodesy team. Could the actual data, for example, a raster or shape file, one day be visible in geodesy, or will it point to data so that the user can download it and view it themselves? Um, so, with uh, rasters and shape files. Um, there is actually a preview of the data on, on our map. So there is that ability to view it to, to some degree. Um, you can, if you want a sort of a more, yeah, as Eugene mentioned, it is done through GeoServer that provides that preview of the data set. Um, more extensive manipulation of those uh, files, those data sets is sort of beyond the scope of what we're planning on doing. Um, but we do provide links to download the data yourself if you want to do more extensive work with it. And just an extra quick note on the geospatial previews too. So I showed one in the 
uh, demonstration. Uh, I did forget to mention that, again, with it being beta, that means we can still like screw it up and not be accountable for it, right? So um, it's where we only have geospatial previews for like recently eight added data right now. Uh, we just um, added the, the full geo server functionality. So that actually means we have to do a full reharvest of all the data um, before it's all that geospatial data is going to be viewable on for, with the uh, with the geospatial previews. So if you come across any data sets that don't look quite right, that's why. Um, so that's that's all going to be flushed out probably sometime in, in the coming couple of months. So just to to add that caveat on there too. Any other questions? Uh, uh, we have another question to, for the Geodesy team uh, about whether or not DataBC's repository is going to be linked in, and what about the USGS Earth Explorer? So I can take that, uh, 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 Ira. Uh, the, uh, the the plan is to to work with all repositories harvested in there uh, further. So I will post the link in a second. There are around seventy repositories, all of them Canadian. Uh, so DataBC is one of them, uh, and we will be harvesting it through the harvester, but not the U.S. Uh, ge geological survey because the focus on further and geodesy is a, a purely Canadian data. Another call for more questions. Um, we have a question about the grad student who initiated the project. We um, the question is to hear how the project has helped. Uh, the grad students research. Thanks, Eka. And I might actually ask if Ira is still here. If Ira, you don't mind unmuting and maybe sharing your video and speaking to that a bit. Sure, Claire, I'd love to. Um, thanks, guys, for that presentation. That was really awesome. Great, uh, uh, a great summary of it and a nice trip down memory lane. I really enjoyed that. Um, my, my research is still very much in progress. Uh, I'm in the third year of my PhD and I have a lot, a lot to do in terms of the analysis and stuff. But one thing that's clear is that this map set, and by the way, we're still cleaning this map set up, um, getting it into a shape that we can really analyze it with, and it's almost there. Uh, but yeah, what's clear is that this is really a one of a kind, uh, geospatial layer of natural resources in British Columbia um, that goes back that far. And I will definitely be using it to estimate, um, you know, how much timber was out on the land base, how much old growth forest there were on the land base, and how those variables have changed over time. But I'll probably also be using it to um, uh, potentially like disaggregate other historical data, which exists at much coarser sort of summary scales. So yeah, I'll definitely, there's really quite a few different uses and there's, there's a whole bunch of other potential applications that I won't even, uh, won't even have a chance to get to. Like you could use this data to uh, look at how spatial patterns of forest age have changed across the landscape, which would be really neat because um, you know, the mountain pine beetle epidemic and wildfire activities and all these sort of, you know, really complex issues in forest management, you could actually start to use this historical data to unpack how these historical landscape changes have uh, fueled, fueled those instances. So there's really a lot, um, a lot that I'll be able to get out of it. And I think there's like a ton more for, for future researchers as well. Any other questions or other comments by anyone in either of the presentations? So I have a, a, um, for Ira, I just found the record of geospatial preview. And this is how it looks like uh, if you uh, want to preview a shape file, it's embedded into the uh, geodesy map. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'll check that out. Thank you. I'm not seeing anything else in chat, so I invite everyone to unmute themselves if they're interested in asking a verbal question. And I believe we have until 4.30.
um, but we could end a little bit early if we're running out of steam. It is, it is the afternoon on Wednesday. And I'm not seeing anything. So Heather, if you'd like to stop the recording, I think that would be okay at this stage. <laughs>